Hey guys, welcome back to another World Audiobooks. We are jumping right into the story of Captain John Carter and his adventures on Mars. Today, Captain Carter gets his first peek of what Mars really looks like, and more importantly, what it feels like. If this story is sounding familiar to you, some of you guys might have actually watched the, the movie that came out, I don't know how many years ago, it was quite a while ago, but there was a movie done of this book, and uh, if you haven't watched it, I'd recommend going and check it out. Pro- probably wait till after you've read the whole book, because... You don't want to spoil the ending with by watching the movie. So like I mentioned in the last episode, if you want to get the full book right away, you can. The link uh, to purchase is down in the description below, or you can just continue getting it here for free, episode by episode on the podcast. Thanks so much for listening today, guys. And now without further ado, I give you the next two chapters of A Princess on Mars. Chapter 3. My Advent on Mars I opened my eyes upon a strange and weird landscape. I knew that I was on Mars. Not once did I question either my sanity or my wakefulness. I was not asleep. No need for pinching here. My inner consciousness told me as plainly that I was upon Mars as your conscious mind tells you that you are upon Earth. You do not question the fact. Neither did I. I found myself lying prone upon a bed of yellowish, moss-like vegetation, which stretched around me in all directions for interminable miles. I seemed to be lying in a deep, circular basin along the outer verge of which I could distinguish the irregularities of low hills. It was midday, the sun was shining full upon me, and the heat of it was rather intense upon my naked body, yet no greater than would have been true under similar conditions on an Arizona desert. Here and there were slight outcroppings of quartz-bearing rock which glistened in the sunlight, and a little to my left, perhaps a hundred yards, appeared a low, walled enclosure about four feet in height. No water and no other vegetation in the moss was in evidence, and as I was somewhat thirsty, I determined to do a little exploring. Springing to my feet, I received my first Martian surprise, for the effort, which on earth would have brought me standing upright, carried me into the Martian air to the height of about three yards. I alighted softly upon the ground, however, without appreciable shock or jar. Now commenced a series of evolutions which, even then, seemed ludicrous in the extreme. I found that I must learn to walk all over again, as the muscular extension which carried me easily and safely upon earth played strange antics with me upon Mars. Instead of progressing in a sane and dignified manner, my attempts to walk resulted in a variety of hops which took me clear of the ground a couple of feet at each step, and landed me sprawling upon my face or back at the end of each second or third hop. My muscles, perfectly attuned and accustomed to the force of gravity on earth, played the mischief with me in attempting for the first time to cope with the lesser gravitation and lower air pressure on Mars. I was determined, however, to explore the low structure which was the only evidence of habitation inside, and so I hit upon the unique plan of reverting to the first principles in locomotion, creeping. I did fairly well at this, and in a few moments had reached the low, encircling wall of the enclosure. There appeared to be no doors or windows upon the side nearest me, but as the wall was about four feet high, I cautiously gained my feet and peered over the top upon the strangest sight it had ever been given me to see. The roof of the enclosure was of solid glass about four or five inches in thickness, and beneath this were several hundred large eggs, perfectly round and snowy white. The eggs were nearly uniform in size, being about two and one-half feet in diameter. Five or six had already hatched, and the grotesque caricatures which sat blinking in the sunlight were enough to cause me to doubt my sanity. They seemed mostly head, with little scrawny bodies, long necks and six legs, or, as I afterwards learned, two legs and two arms, with an intermediary pair of limbs which could be used at will either as arms or legs. Their eyes were set at the extreme sides of their head, a trifle above the center, and protruded in such a manner that they could be directed either forward or back, and also independently of each other, thus preventing this queer animal to look in any direction or in two directions at once, without the necessity of turning the head. The ears, which were slightly above the eyes and closer together, were small, cup-shaped antennae, protruding not more than an inch on these young specimens. Their noses were but longitudinal slits in the center of their faces, midway between their mouths and ears. There was no hair on their bodies, which were of a very light yellowish-green color. In the adults, as I was to learn quite soon, this color deepens to an olive green, and is darker in the male than in the female. Further, the heads of the adults are not so out of proportion to their bodies, as in the case of the young. The iris of the eyes is blood red, as in albinos, while the pupil is dark. The eyeball itself is very white, as are the teeth. These latter add a most ferocious appearance to an otherwise fearsome and terrible countenance, as the lower tusks curve upward to sharp points, which end about where the eye of earthly human beings are located. The whiteness of the teeth is not that of ivory, but of the snowiest and most gleaming of china. Against the dark background of their olive skins, their tusks stand out in a most striking manner, 
making these weapons present a singularly formidable appearance. Most of these details I noted later, for I was given but little time to speculate on the wonders of my new discovery. I had seen that the eggs were in the process of hatching, and as I stood watching the hideous little monsters break from their shells, I failed to note the approach of a score of full-grown Martians from behind me. Coming as they did, over the soft and soundless moss, which covers practically the entire surface of Mars, with the exception of the frozen areas of the poles and the scattered cultivated districts, they might have captured me easily, but their intentions were far more sinister. It was the rattling of the accoutrements of the foremost warrior which warned me. On such a little thing my life hung that I often marveled that I escaped so easily, had not the rifle of the leader of the party swung from his fastening beside his saddle in such a way as to strike against the butt of his great metal shod spear, I should have snuffed out without ever knowing that death was near me. But the little sound caused me to turn, and there upon me, not ten feet from my breast, was the point of that huge spear, a spear forty feet long, tipped with gleaming metal, and held low at the side of a mounted replica of the little devils I had been watching. But how puny and harmless they now looked beside this huge and terrific incarnation of hate, of vengeance, and of death. The man himself, for such I may call them, was fully fifteen feet in height, and, on earth, would have weighed some four hundred pounds. He sat his mount as we sit a horse, grasping the animal's barrel with his lower limbs, while the hands of his two right arms held his immense spear low at the side of his mount. His two left arms were outstretched laterally to help preserve his balance, the thing he rode having neither bridle or reins of any description for guidance. And his mount? How can earthly words describe it? It towered ten feet at the shoulder, had four legs on either side, a broad, flat tail, larger at the tip than at the root, and which it held straight out behind while running, a gaping mouth which split its head from snout to his long, massive neck. Like its master, it was entirely devoid of hair, but was of a dark slate color and exceedingly smooth and glossy. Its belly was white, and its legs shaded from the slate of its shoulders and hips to a vivid yellow at the feet. The feet themselves were heavily padded and nailless, which fact had also contributed to the noiselessness of their approach, and, in common with a multiplicity of legs, is a characteristic feature of the fauna of Mars. The highest type of man and one other animal, the only mammal existing on Mars, alone have well-formed nails, and there are absolutely no hoofed animals in existence there. Behind this first charging demon trailed nineteen others, similar in all respects, but, as I learned, bearing individual characteristics peculiar to themselves. Precisely as no two of us are identical, although we are all cast in a similar mold, this picture, or rather materialized nightmare, which I have described at length, made but one terrible and swift impression on me as I turned to meet it. Unarmed and naked as I was, the first law of nature manifested itself in the only possible solution of my immediate problem, and that was to get out of the vicinity of the point of the charging spear. Consequently, I gave a very earthly and at the same time superhuman leap to reach the top of the Martian incubator, for such I had determined it must be. My effort was crowned with a success which appalled me no less than it seemed to surprise the Martian warriors, for it carried me fully thirty feet into the air and landed me a hundred feet from my pursuers and on the opposite side of the enclosure. I alighted upon the soft moss easily and without mishap, and turning saw my enemies lined up upon the further wall. Some were surveying me with expressions which I afterward discovered marked extreme astonishment, and the others were evidently satisfying themselves that I had not molested their young. They were conversing together in low tones, and gesticulating and pointing towards me. Their discovery that I had not harmed the little Martians, and that I was unarmed, must have caused them to look upon me with less ferocity. But, as I was to learn later, the thing which weighed most in my favor was my exhibition of hurdling. While the Martians are immense, their bones are very large, and they are muscled only in proportion to the gravitation which they must overcome. The result is that they are infinitely less agile and less powerful in proportion to their weight than an Earthman and I doubt that were one of them suddenly to be transported to earth, he could lift his own weight from the ground. In fact, I am convinced that he could not do so. My feet then was as marvelous upon Mars as it would have been upon earth, and from desiring to annihilate me, they suddenly looked upon me as a wonderful discovery to be captured and exhibited among their fellows. The respite my unexpected agility had given me permitted me to formulate plans for the immediate future and to note more closely the appearance of the warriors, for I could not disassociate these people in my mind from those warriors who, only the day before, had been pursuing me. I noted that each was armed with several other weapons in addition to the huge spear which I have described. The weapon which caused me to decide against any attempt at escape by flight was what was evidently a rifle of some description, and which, I felt for some reason, they were peculiarly efficient in handling. These rifles were of a white metal stocked with wood, which I learned later was a very light and intensely hard growth much prized on Mars, and entirely unknown to us denizens of Earth. 
The metal of the barrel is an alloy composed principally of aluminum and steel, which they have learned to temper to a hardness far exceeding that of steel with which we are familiar. The weight of these rifles is comparatively little, and with the smaller caliber explosive radium projectiles which they use and the great length of the barrel, they are deadly in the extreme and at ranges which would be unthinkable on earth. The theoretic effective radius of this rifle is 300 miles, but the best they can do in actual service when equipped with their wireless finders and sighters is but a trifle over 200 miles. This is quite far enough to imbue me with great respect for the Martian firearm, and some telepathic force must have warned me against an attempt to escape in broad daylight from under the muzzles of twenty of these death-dealing machines. The Martians, after conversing for a short time, turned and rode away in the direction from which they had come, leaving one of their number alone by the enclosure. When they had covered perhaps two hundred yards, they halted, and turning their mounts toward us, watched the warrior by the enclosure. He was the one whose spirit so nearly transfixed me, and was evidently the leader of the band, as I noted that they seemed to have moved to their present position at his direction. When his force had come to a halt, he dismounted, threw down his spear and small arms, and came around the end of the incubator towards me, entirely unarmed and as naked as I, except the ornaments strapped about his head, limbs, and breast. When he was within about fifty feet of me, he unclasped an enormous metal armlet, and holding it towards me in the open palm of his hand, addressed me in a clear, resonant voice, but in a language, it is needless to say, I could not understand. He then stopped as though waiting for my reply, pricking up his antenna-like ears and cocking his strange-looking eyes still further toward me. As the silence became painful, I concluded to hazard a little conversation on my own part, as I had guessed that he was making overtures of peace. The throwing down of his weapons, and the withdrawing of his troop before his advance toward me, would have signified a peaceful mission anywhere on Earth, so why not then on Mars? Placing my hand over my heart, I bowed low to the Martian, and explained to him that while I did not understand his language, his actions spoke for peace and friendship that at the present moment were most dear to my heart. Of course, I might have been a babbling brook for all the intelligence my speech carried to him, but he understood the action with which I immediately followed my words. Stretching my hand toward him, I advanced and took the armlet from his open palm, clasping it about my arm above the elbow, smiled at him, and stood waiting. His wide mouth spread into an answering smile, and locking one of his intermediary arms with mine, we turned and walked back toward his mount. At the same time, he motioned his followers to advance. They started toward us on a wild run, but were checked by a signal from him. Evidently, he feared that were I to be really frightened again, I might jump entirely out of the landscape. He exchanged a few words with his men, motioned to me that I would ride behind one of them, and then mounted his own animal. The fellow designated reached down two or three hands and lifted me up behind him on the glossy back of his mount, where I hung on as best I could by the belts and straps which held the Martian's weapons and ornaments. The entire cavalcade then turned and galloped away toward the range of hills in the distance. Chapter 4. A Prisoner We had gone perhaps ten miles when the ground began to rise very rapidly. We were, as I was later to learn, nearing the edge of one of Mars' long-dead seas, in the bottom of which my encounter with the Martians had taken place. In a short time we gained the foot of the mountains, and after traversing a narrow gorge came to an open valley, at the far extremity of which was a low tableland upon which I beheld an enormous city. Toward this we galloped, entering it by what appeared to be a ruined roadway leading out of the city, but only to the edge of the tableland, where it ended abruptly in a flight of broad steps. Upon closer observation, I saw, as we passed them, that the buildings were deserted, and while not greatly decayed, had the appearance of not having been tenanted for years, possibly for ages. Toward the center of the city was a large plaza, and upon this and in the buildings immediately surrounding it were camped some nine or ten hundred creatures of the same breed as my captors, for such I now considered them despite the suave manner in which I had been trapped." With the exception of their ornaments, all were naked. The women varied in appearance, but little from the men, except their tusks were much larger in proportion to their height, in some instances curving nearly to their high-set ears. Their bodies were smaller and lighter in color, and their fingers and toes wore the rudiments of nails, which were entirely lacking among the males. The adult females ranged in height from ten to twelve feet. The children were light in color, even lighter than the women, and all looked precisely alike to me, except that some were taller than others, older, I presumed. I saw no signs of extreme age among them, 
nor was there any appreciable difference in their appearance from the age of maturity, about forty, until, at about the age of one thousand years, they go voluntarily upon their last strange pilgrimage down the river Is, which leads no living Martian knows whither, and from whose bosom no Martian has ever returned, or would be allowed to live did he return after once embarking upon its cold, dark waters. Only about one Martian in a thousand dies of sickness or disease, and possibly about twenty take the voluntary pilgrimage. The other 979 die violent deaths in duels, in hunting, in aviation, and in war. But perhaps by far the greatest death loss comes during the age of childhood, when vast numbers of the little Martians fall victims to the great white apes of Mars. The average life expectancy of a Martian after the age of maturity is about 300 years, but would be nearer the 1,000 mark were it not for the various means leading to violent death. Owing to the waning resources of the planet, it evidently became necessary to counteract the increasing longevity which their remarkable skill in therapeutics and surgery produced, and so human life has come to be considered but lightly on Mars, as is evidenced by their dangerous sports and the almost continual warfare between the various communities. There are other unnatural causes tending toward a diminution of population, but nothing contributes so greatly to this end as the fact that no male or female Martian is ever voluntarily without a weapon of destruction. As we neared the plaza and my presence was discovered, we were immediately surrounded by hundreds of the creatures, who seemed anxious to pluck me from my seat behind my guard. A word from the leader of the party stilled their clamor, and we proceeded at a trot across the plaza to the entrance of as magnificent an edifice as mortal eye has rested upon. The building was low, but covered an enormous area. It was constructed of gleaming white marble, inlaid with gold, and brilliant stones which sparkled in the sunlight. The main entrance was some hundred feet in width, and projected from the building proper to form a huge canopy above the entrance hall. There was no stairway, but a gentle incline to the first floor of the building opened into an enormous chamber encircled by galleries. On the floor of this chamber, which was dotted with highly carved wooden desks and chairs, were assembled about forty or fifty male Martians around the steps of a rostrum. On the platform proper squatted an enormous warrior, heavily loaded with metal ornaments, gay-colored feathers, and beautifully wrought leather trappings ingeniously set with precious stones. From his shoulders depended a short cape of white fur lined with brilliant scarlet silk. What struck me as most remarkable about this assemblage, and the hall in which they were congregated, was the fact that the creatures were entirely out of proportion to the desks, chairs, and other furnishings, these being of a size adapted to human beings such as I, whereas the great bulks of the Martians could scarcely have squeezed into the chairs, nor was there room beneath the desks for their long legs. Evidently, then, there were other denizens on Mars than the wild and grotesque creatures into whose hands I had fallen, but the evidences of extreme antiquity which showed all around me indicated that these buildings might have belonged to some long extinct and forgotten race in the dim antiquity of Mars. Our party had halted at the entrance to the building, and at a sign from the leader I had been lowered to the ground. Again, locking his arm in mine, we had proceeded into the audience chamber. There were few formalities observed in approaching the Martian chieftain. My captain merely strode up to the rostrum, the others making way for him as he advanced. The chieftain rose to his feet, and uttered the name of my escort, who, in turn, halted, and repeated the name of the ruler, followed by his title. At the time, this ceremony and the words they uttered meant nothing to me, but later I came to know that this was the customary greeting between green Martians. Had the men been strangers, and therefore unable to exchange names, they would have silently exchanged ornaments, had their mission been peaceful. Otherwise, they would have exchanged shots or have fought out their introduction with some of their various weapons. My captor, whose name was Tars Tarkas, was virtually the vice-chieftain of the community, and a man of great ability as a statesman and warrior. He evidently explained briefly the incidents connected with my expedition, including my capture, and when he had concluded, the chieftain addressed me at some length. I replied in our good old English tongue merely to convince him that neither of us could understand the other, but I noticed that when I smiled slightly on concluding, he did likewise. This fact, and the similar recurrence during my first talk with Tars Tarkas, convinced me that we had at least something in common, the ability to smile, therefore to laugh, denoting a sense of humor. But I was to learn that the Martian smile is merely perfunctory, and that the Martian laugh is a thing to cause strong men to blanch in horror. The ideas of humor among the green men of Mars are widely at variance with our conception of incitance to merriment. The death agonies of a fellow being are, to these strange creatures, provocative to the wildest hilarity, while their chief form of commonest amusement is to inflict death on their prisoners of war in various ingenious and horrible ways. The assembled warriors and chieftains examined me closely, feeling my muscles and the texture of my skin. The principal chieftain then evidently signified a desire to see me perform, and, motioning me to follow, he started with Tars Tarkas for the open plaza. 
Now, I had made no attempt to walk since my first signal failure, except while tightly grasping Tars Tarkas' arm, and so now I went skipping and flitting about among the desks and chairs like some monstrous grasshopper. After bruising myself severely, much to the amusement of the Martians, I again had recourse to creeping, but this did not suit them, and I was roughly jerked to my feet by a towering fellow who had laughed most heartily at my misfortunes. As he banged me down upon my feet, his face was bent close to mine, and I did the only thing a gentleman might do under the circumstances of brutality, boorishness, and a lack of consideration for a stranger's rights. I swung my fist squarely to his jaw, and he went down like a felled ox. As he sunk to the floor, I wheeled around with my back towards the nearest desk, expecting to be overwhelmed by the vengeance of his fellows, but determined to give them as good a battle as the unequaled odds would permit before I gave up my life. My fears were groundless, however, as the other Martians, at first struck dumb with wonderment, finally broke into wild peals of laughter and applause. I did not recognize the applause as such, but later, when I had become acquainted with their customs, I learned that I had won what they seldom accord, a manifestation of approbation. The fellow whom I had struck lay where he had fallen, nor did any of his mates approach him. Tars Tarkas advanced toward me, holding out one of his arms, and we thus proceeded to the plaza without further mishap. I did not, of course, know the reason for which we had come to the open, but I was not long in being enlightened. They first repeated the word sock a number of times, and then Tars Tarkas made several jumps, repeating the same word before each leap. Then, turning to me, he said, Sock. I saw what they were after, and gathering myself together, I socked, with such marvelous success that I cleared a good hundred and fifty feet. Nor did I this time lose my equilibrium, but landed squarely upon my feet without falling. I then returned by easy jumps of twenty-five or thirty feet to the little group of warriors. My exhibition had been witnessed by several hundred lesser Martians, and they immediately broke into demands for repetition, which the chieftain then ordered me to make. But I was both hungry and thirsty, and determined on the spot that my only method of salvation was to demand the consideration from these creatures which they evidently would not voluntarily accord. I therefore ignored the repeated commands to sock, and each time they were made, I motioned to my mouth and rubbed my stomach. Tars Tarkas and the chief exchanged a few words, and the former, calling to a young female among the throng, gave us some instructions and motioned me to accompany her. I grasped her proffered arm, and together we crossed the plaza toward a large building on the far side. My fair companion was about eight feet tall, having just arrived at maturity, but not yet to her full height. She was of a light olive-green color with a smooth, glossy hide. Her name, as I afterward learned, was Sola, and she belonged to the retinue of Tars Tarkas. She conducted me to a spacious chamber in one of the buildings fronting on the plaza, and which, from the litter of silks and furs upon the floor, I took to be the sleeping quarters of several of the natives. The room was well lighted by a large number of windows, and was beautifully decorated with mural paintings and mosaics, but upon all these seemed to rest the indefinable touch of the fingers of antiquity, which convinced me that the architects and builders of these wondrous creations had nothing in common with the crude half-brutes which now occupied them. Solo motioned me to be seated upon a pile of silks near the center of the room, and, turning, made a peculiar hissing sound, as though signaling to someone in an adjoining room. In response to her call, I obtained my first sight of a new Martian wonder. It waddled in on its ten short legs, and squatted down before the girl like an obedient puppy. The thing was about the size of a Shetland pony, but its head bore a slight resemblance to that of a frog, except that the jaws were equipped with three rows of long, sharp tusks. <laughs> All right, once again, thank you guys so much for listening. I know I say it all the time, but I can't say it enough because I'm just so grateful that you guys tune in and listen to the podcast, and we're, we're growing. We're slowly growing, and that is because you guys are spreading the word. So do that on social media. You can like and follow the podcast. All the links are down below, and it's a great way to tell your friends and family about this free, awesome audiobooks because that's what free things are for, is to be shared with other people. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for spreading the word. And remember, if you're just tuning into the podcast, there's an entire backlist of episodes. So go back and listen to all those. We've got all kinds of awesome books there that you can listen to as well. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll talk to you next time.